Okay, we're going to be working our way towards understanding how various types of lenses form images. In order to do so, however, we have to do an intermediate topic first, and this has to do with refraction at a spherical surface. Here's how I demonstrate this. What I do is I pass around this glass paperweight that somebody bought for me a number of years ago. I pass this around the room for you to examine. And inside the paperweight, there's a little scuba diver and there's a little reef here. And then if you look at the scuba diver or the reef at different angles as I rotate the paperweight around like so, you can then see the image of the objects inside the paperweight appear to shift a little bit depending upon what the radius of curvature is based upon the surface that you're looking at. So let me hold this up to the phone a little bit more closely so that you can see this. like so, and then I rotate it around like this, and then you can see images of the scuba diver inside and a little reef, and it appears as if the images shift around a little bit in terms of their distance from the surface itself. So we have to understand exactly how refraction occurs at a spherical surface here in order to ultimately understand later on how lenses work. Okay, so refraction of a spherical surface involves the derivation of an expression. This expression then carries over later on into lenses. Like the mirror equation earlier for the law of reflection, there is a sign convention associated with the equation I'm about to derive. That sign convention later on carries over into lenses. Okay, here's the situation. All right, so we have refraction. In a spherical surface. And the easiest way to derive the equation that I'm looking for is to set up the following scenario. Okay, so let's say that right here is a spherical surface, it's a boundary between two different media. Right over here is an index of refraction N1, right over here is an index of refraction N2, and by definition we're going to say that N2 is greater than N1. Okay, here's an optical axis like so. Right here is a right angle. And then we're just going to have a point object in front of this spherical surface over here on the left hand side of my diagram. So right over here we'll say is an object like so, and we'll label this as O, and then therefore the object is some distance away from the surface. This object distance is referred to as DO, just as it is when talking about mirrors from earlier. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and refract two light rays here across the surface, and then therefore I'm going to form the image when I do. Okay, the first light ray, I'm just going to send it from the object itself along the optical axis like this. And then when I do, the angle of incidence right here is zero degrees. From Snell's law, the sine of zero is equal to zero, therefore the refracted angle is zero degrees as well. In other words, this light ray just goes all the way through. like so. Okay, and then just arbitrarily a second light ray to this point will say right here at the spherical surface. Okay, now right here is my normal line. This is the dotted line that is perpendicular to the surface right here at this location. <coughs> if I extend it back behind the surface itself to the axis, this then right here is the center of this sphere. This then means that this distance here is the radius of curvature. Okay, now looking at this refraction that I'm about to perform here, right here is the angle of incidence, like so. And then what we're doing here in this scenario is we're refracting from low to high index of refraction. So then therefore I have to bend towards the dotted line when I refract across the surface. And then look like this. like so. And then notice that right here, the two refractions then converge at this point. This right here is where the image is located. Okay, on this diagram, right here is the angle of refraction. Okay, now this distance here, the distance that the image is from the surface, this right here is referred to as dr. So once again, the goal of this derivation is to find the following expression, an expression that relates all these distances to each other into the two indices of refraction. Okay, it's just a little bit of geometry in Snell's law in order to arrive at this relationship. On this diagram, however, I have to define a few more things. I have to define a bunch of angles. So first of all, this angle right here is referred to as alpha. This angle right here is referred to as beta. 
This one right here is referred to as gamma. And then lastly, this one right here is referred to as phi. We also label this distance right here, we label this distance as h. Okay, now let's apply Snell's law to the situation. So n1 sine theta incident is equal to n2 sine theta refractive. We're immediately going to make a small angle approximation here. Quite honestly, I realistically can't do that with certain portions of the paperweight here as I rotate it around. You can see that some of the images of the objects inside are distorted as I do. But as we'll see later on when you're talking about lenses, this is a perfectly valid approximation to make. So for the small angle approximation here, all I'm going to simply do is replace the signs of the angles here in Snell's Law, which is the angles themselves. So N1 theta incident equals N2 theta refracted for that reason. And then basically what I have to do here on this diagram is turn all of these angles here, theta incident and the theta refracted, I have to turn them basically into distances on the diagram, and that involves a few geometrical steps. So here are those steps. Okay, first of all, take a look right here. Notice that phi plus theta is equal to 180 degrees. Like so. Okay, and then I've got a triangle right here from this point to this point to this point. And the sum of the angles in a triangle is equal to 180. So theta refracted, one of the angles that I want, theta refracted plus phi plus gamma is equal to 180. Okay, now what I'm going to do with these little relationships here, because they're both equal to 180, is just set them equal to each other. So, okay, the angle phi cancels out, like so, and then theta refracted is going to be beta minus gamma, like so. We're going to write this over here on the right-hand side of Snell's Law in just a few moments. Okay, now before we do, however, we need to get rid of theta incident as well. Here's how we go about doing that. Okay, take a look. I'm going to draw on the diagram right here. And this angle here in blue, like so. Okay, I'm not going to name that angle, but notice that it's the supplement of theta incident. So this blue angle right here is 180 minus theta incident. And then what I'm going to do is take that blue angle, add it to alpha and beta. This right here is another triangle. So the blue angle plus alpha plus beta is equal to 180. All right, so alpha plus beta plus the blue angle. The blue angle is 180 minus theta incident. This then equals 180. And now what I'm going to do is take this expression here, to 180s cancel out, and just solve it for theta incident. So theta incident into alpha plus beta. Okay, so now let's go up into Snell's Law right here and replace the angles theta incident and theta refracted with these other angles. So on the left-hand side of the expression here, I have N1 times theta incident, which is this guy here. And on the right-hand side of the expression, N2 times theta refracted, which is this guy here. Like so. Okay, so, so far, all that I've done is replace theta incident and theta refracted with a few other angles. So how does that help me? Well, now let's go ahead and look at the diagram once again. Let me go ahead and do some racing here first. Okay, first of all, take a look at alpha, which is right over here on the diagram. And specifically what we're going to do is we're going to take the tangent of alpha. Okay, the tangent of alpha is equal to the opposite side, which is right here, h. And yes, it is curved, but because we're making a small angle approximation, we can now visualize this right here as a right triangle. So tangent of alpha is h over do. But because the angle is small, we could just write the angle itself as h over do. And now we're basically going to do the same thing for beta and gamma. So next, take a look at the tangent of beta. The tangent of beta is h over r. Tangent of beta is h over r. However, once again, we're making a small angle approximation. So now we just write beta 
as h over r. And lastly, do the same thing here with the tangent of gamma. The tangent of gamma is h over di. Okay, once again, the angle is small, so therefore just gamma by itself is h over di. And now I take all of these little relationships here, relationships here, alpha, beta, and gamma, and plug them here into Snell's law. Okay, so n1 times alpha plus beta, so h over do plus h over r. Right-hand side of the expression, n2, and then beta, h over r, minus gamma, h over di. And notice that all the h's here cancel out. Like so. And now we end up with an equation here. I'm going to rearrange it in just a moment. We end up with an equation here that relates the three distances together, do, di, and the radius of curvature, as well as the two indices of refraction. Okay, let me go ahead and algebraically manipulate that expression. Okay, we don't need this garbage anymore, so let's get rid of that. The hard part's over. Okay, and now if you algebraically manipulate the expression, you end up with this equation here. Like so, this expression here is the exact same thing as the last step, just with the terms moved around. Okay, now as I mentioned earlier, there is a sign convention associated with this equation, and then that sign convention later on carries on into lenses. Okay, when I initially write down the sign convention, you're going to look at it and you're going to go, huh? But then once you start to use the sign convention, much like we used the sign convention for mirrors earlier, it actually makes perfect sense and it's easy to do. And then, anyway, however, let me go ahead and write out the sign convention for you first. Okay, first of all, the object distance DO. The object distance DO is a positive number if the object is on the same side of the surface from where the light is coming from. Okay, initially that sounds very confusing, but as I said, once you see how it works in problems, it's actually very simple. Okay, now the object distance can be negative. The object distance is negative if the object is on the opposite side of the surface from where light is coming from. Okay, now, Throughout the remainder of the sign convention, I'm basically going to be saying the same phrase over and over, either the same side or the opposite side of the surface from where the light is coming from. So I don't want to write this phrase here over and over and over, and I suspect you don't want to either. So then, therefore, I'm just going to go ahead and use some quotation marks here for the remainder of the phrase. That's perfectly fine. Okay, now we get to the image distance di. The image distance di and the radius of curvature are backwards of the object distance. Okay, first of all, the image distance di. The image distance di is a positive number if the image is on the opposite side of the surface from where the light is coming from. Once again, using quotations for those phrases. Okay, and then the image distance is negative if the image is on the same side of the surface from where the light is coming from. Okay, once again, I'm going to use quotation marks here. I don't want to write that phrase over and over. Okay, and then lastly is the radius of curvature R. The radius of curvature R is a positive number if the center of the sphere is on the opposite side of the surface from where the light is coming from. 
the center and the seam is on the opposite side of the surface from where white is coming from. And then lastly is a negative number that the center of the sphere is on the same side of the surface from where white is coming from. here for those phrases. Okay, as I said earlier, when you initially write this down, it looks very confusing, but as we start to take a look at today's examples, it actually makes perfect sense. Okay, let me go ahead and pause this here as part one of this lecture. We'll look at the examples in part two.